It's question show time. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are on my channel, question pops into your brain, write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. Happy 100th question show. People were wondering if we were going to do anything special. Uh, no, nothing special, except we've got an awesome guest answerer this week, Anton Petrov, a wonderful person. So, uh, let's get into the questions. Go green. The estimated remaining lifespan of the sun is 5 billion years, but when the conditions for life would become unbearable for earthlings? Around 250 million years from now, perhaps earlier? The sun has, as you said, about 5 billion years left of its main sequence phase. So it's got about 5 billion years of hydrogen fuel in its core that it can use. <laughs> a bit of a storm going through right now. Uh, hydrogen fuel in its core that it can use to burn. And when it runs out, it's going to blow it up as a red giant, shrink back down, blow it back up, shrink back down, and eventually slough off all of its outer layers and become a white dwarf. And it's going to eat Mercury and Venus, and maybe it's going to eat Earth, or maybe as it loses its mass, the Earth is going to orbit away from it and, uh, and Earth will be safe. But Earth won't be safe. Earth will have been killed billions of years before that. And that's because the sun is actually heating up. So in the core of the sun, right, you've got this hydrogen turning into helium, and the helium is building up in this layer that's outside of the main core of the sun. And what that's doing is it's causing the sort of the core of the sun to expand a little bit, and it's making the overall sun give off a little bit more heat. So the amount of radiation that's hitting the Earth is increasing. That's going to get bad a lot sooner than that. So estimates are right now that we've got about a billion years left before the temperatures that reach the Earth get so hot that the oceans evaporate away and then the solar wind will blow all of the hydrogen off into space like it did to Mars and, and the Earth will be kind of like Venus uh, without maybe that thick of an atmosphere. So, so really we've got f a billion years, maybe half a billion years left before planet Earth becomes uninhabitable. And so that's why people are proposing these ideas to move the Earth, that we could work out some kind of relationship with some, you know, uh, get some asteroid that comes back every 10,000 years or so and shifts our orbit a tiny little bit and the Earth slowly drifts away from the Sun at the same time that the Sun is continuing to heat up and we're getting more and more radiation that's hitting the Earth. So, so yeah, we don't have 5 billion years, we really only have about half a billion years to a billion years left where the Earth becomes uninhabitable. Dizzy AZ. Our galaxy is warped because it collided with another galaxy. Could its supermassive black hole be out there waiting to be discovered? fairly recent news that's coming out now, people have been done fairly accurate estimates of the shape of the galaxy. And of course, that's really difficult because we are inside the galaxy. So how do you measure the shape? And it's very difficult. But they've been able to, to work out that in fact, the galaxy isn't this flat disk, it actually has a slight warp to it, which means that the Milky Way interacted with some other galaxy in the ancient past, probably not like a full on Milky Way Andromeda collision, but more like we have absorbed various dwarf galaxies. And some of those dwarf galaxies probably had supermassive black holes in them. And what happened to those supermassive black holes? Well, either they merged with a supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, or they were kicked out uh, into deep space, or maybe they're still orbiting around within the Milky Way somewhere. Where are they? We don't know. Now, you don't have to be worried about this, of course, right? The, like, the sun has been orbiting in the Milky Way for, for four and a half, almost five billion years, and no big black hole has come close enough to disrupt the orbits of the planet. So we can kind of assume that the chances of this happening are very low. But maybe over time, as we do more and more surveys, maybe as the Gaia spacecraft explores more and more of the Milky Way, we will start to notice the ripples of other supermassive black holes moving through the Milky Way and shifting stars out as they move through their wake, which is a really fascinating idea. So, so all hail Gaia. Hare Destinies. Hey Fraser, love to watch your videos before going to bed, but I have one question. What if Mars replaces the moon, but 700,000 kilometers from Earth, can it be habitable? Did you hear that hoax that was going around a couple of years ago that, that 
Mars would appear as big as the moon in the sky. And of course it wasn't true. And it was like this misprint of an email newsletter that had been sent out. And every year I got to debunk once again that no, Mars was not gonna look as big as the moon in the nighttime sky. Well, what if we replace the moon with Mars? What would happen? Would Mars be habitable? Well, Mars would be warmer, but it would still have a very low amount of atmosphere. So you would need to thicken the atmosphere. And if you did thicken the atmosphere, then the solar wind <clears throat> would be even closer and stronger from this perspective. And so it would continue to blow away the atmosphere of Mars. So if it was closer to the sun, it would probably have been made, like removed all its atmosphere a lot sooner. But Mars and the Earth would become this double planet because Mars and, and Earth would orbit this common center of gravity. Uh, it would be a lot easier to get to. It would cause massive tides on the Earth. Maybe Earth wouldn't be inhabitable because of the massive tides from Mars. So I don't think that bringing Mars close to the Earth is a great idea. I, please don't do it. Uh, I like Mars where it is farther out into the solar system, but it's still fascinating. Can you imagine if you looked up into the sky and you saw Mars, it would be so much bigger than the moon and it would just be like right there in the sky, which would be pretty exciting. So maybe try it briefly and then put it back. Veggie T 2009. Are bed bugs resistant to space travel? If so, what can we do to prevent solar system wide outbreaks starting with our future moon and Mars colonies? I don't know if bed bugs are resistant to space travel. I mean, wherever we go here on earth, we take our parasites with us and lice probably, you know, they're holding on to your head and they're moving around. Bed bugs are holding on to your bed and moving around. It seems like we'll take a bunch of this stuff with us to space. Can you imagine a bed bug infestation on the International Space Station? That's where you just like vent the atmosphere and you blast the bed bugs out into space. So I think we will find out. NASA is really starting to learn what kinds of life forms are very tough and can handle uh, the conditions out in space, the microgravity, the temperature changes, the radiation and things like that. And eventually we're gonna figure out which of our creepy crawlies can handle it too. So I wouldn't be surprised. Leonard Signets, best use of the moon, resources. Build a mass driver as quickly as practicable to lessen the need for propellants for launching. Just get the products of mining and refining up to 1,500 meters per second, then use a modest amount of rocket thrust to circularize, and we're golden. Teleoperate as much as possible from Earth or a cis lunar space station. Gravity wells are for suckers. Too bad virtually all the resources are at the bottom of these wells. Yeah, a lot of people didn't like me not being super fond of the moon and the things we could do with the moon. And, and the gravity well, I think, is, is the bigger problem. So I think, I think what you're describing, Leonard, is like the, the medium stage. The first stage is we use up the asteroids. We dismantle the asteroids because they really have no gravity well. We're really learning that like things like Bennu and Ryugu, they're just like these rubble piles, gravel, all just kind of collected together from mutual gravity. You just go with a bucket and just scoop it up and take it and turn it into O'Neill cylinders. But then once a lot of those easy asteroids have been mined out, then we're gonna wanna go for things like the moon. And then you're exactly right. Have a station above, teleoperate, big excavators that are pulling material off the surface of the moon, dumping them into rail guns. The rail guns are firing the stuff off into space. They've got some little rocket engine on board that will circularize the orbit. You retrieve the material and and away you go, building your <coughs> super O'Neill cylinder. So I think that's like the middle stage. For now, it'll be like Antarctica. We'll explore it, we'll enjoy it, we'll jump around on it and think how cool it is to have low gravity and then and understand the history of it, where it came from. And then 50 years from now, 75 years from now, we'll start to harvest its resources. Silist. Are we perusing other methods of measuring gravitational waves? So far, laser interferometry seems the only idea being used. That is an excellent question. And, and just the fact that we can even detect gravitational waves is one of the triumphs in modern experimental physics. A lot of people, you know, as they were developing this technique of laser interferometry, where you bounce this laser back and forth between two mirrors that are more than a kilometer apart, and you're waiting to see those mirrors be moved apart just a tiny little bit 
telling you that the distortions of space-time from black holes hundreds of millions of light years away are washing over the planet. Like, if anyone deserves a Nobel Prize, it's the teams that did that. And they got one. So, but no, it's not the only idea. Uh, there are some other ideas. There's sort of two flavors that this take. So one idea is that gravitational waves could affect the way particles work. So there's, you know, and I'm not a particle physicist, uh, so, so there are a variety of particles that operate in a very set, specific, and very detectable way. And so as a gravitational wave goes over, say like uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate where you've got these particles all acting together in, in this larger formation, as a gravitational wave passes over, you might get some kind of disruption in this Bose-Einstein condensate, which could then be detected. So one line of study is looking at particles, and then the other line is sort of at the largest scale, at cosmological scales, where you've got some kind of gravitational wave passing through some large structure of dust or a galaxy cluster or something like that, and the ripples are made permanent in a way that we could detect them from here on Earth with really careful observations with telescopes. So right now, none of these have been developed in any practical way, but you can imagine in the future, some of these ideas may be turned into, into real experiments. Once our current methods of, of scanning for gravitational waves using laser interferometry runs out, maybe some of these others will bear some fruit. So it's, a, it's an interesting idea to think of. And I wasn't actually aware of this until I did a little bit of research based on your question, which I hadn't occurred, it hadn't occurred to me. So thank you for the question. I loved it. And clearly it could be a video at some point. Federico Fudio. Would it be possible to make a Voyager-like probe that will remain asleep for hundreds of years so that later on we could send a signal to turn it on and start sending data back to Earth once it reaches another star system? So the Voyager spacecraft and a lot of the other spacecraft that operate in the solar system use what's called a, uh, an RTG, a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator. And what it is really is it's a chunk of plutonium which is decaying. And as it's decaying, it's giving off heat. And then they have a thermocouple, they have a gadget that can extract heat and turn that heat into electricity. And so really, you know, we call it like a nuclear battery. And what it is, is that each of the spacecraft that are in the outer solar system, they all have one of these chunks of plutonium. And the moment you put the plutonium in, it's starting to, once it's done, it's starting to decay. And so you can't turn it off. And over the course of decades, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, it will start to decay to the point that it won't be able to provide any more electricity. And so if we think about a spacecraft that we want to send to another star system, we're looking at thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and the plutonium will have decayed way beyond the point that you could extract any usable energy from it. So that wouldn't work using this technology. You would need some other kind of technology. And I can't imagine a battery could hold its charge for tens of thousands of years. Solar panels, where the, the solar panels somehow, when they enter sunlight from some other star system, then they start to generate power and then it's able to, I don't know, use robot replicators to build new solar panels and build up its, its uh, power infrastructure. So it's a pretty big challenge and I can't think of a way right now that we know how to do it. Katsu Zatoichi. Can I safely jump on these moons? I mean, travel all the way out to one of Mars' moons, jumping around for a little fun just to notice I suddenly float around into space? Unless you're really strong and you have like a really good grip on the surface, you wouldn't be able to jump off. Uh, the escape velocity of Phobos is about 41 kilometers per hour. So if you can run 41 kilometers per hour, you could run off of Phobos, or if you can jump 41 kilometers per hour, um, which I don't think we can. Uh, now, the escape velocity of Deimos is 20 kilometers per hour, and that's getting kind of closer, but to actually try to run, you would have a really hard time because we, we take advantage of friction and gravity here on Earth to keep us stuck to the Earth so that we can run really quickly. But on Deimos, every step that you took would launch you hundreds of meters into the air and then you would come back down and then you would take another step. 
So you would have a really hard time uh, getting away from either one of those moons. And in fact, it would be fun. It would be kind of scary, right? Can you imagine like you do jump and you fly up into space hundreds of meters into the air and then come back down and to some other spot and yet you would it would be you know we're so used to being scared of heights and so you would be up at this these crazy heights and yet you would be safe because if you can jump up you can handle the landing as well so it's a i, I want to try it yes please sim roger sr still enjoying your videos from here in the uk and after watching recent ones wondered what could be seen of our solar system from alpha centauri if all or any of our current ground and space-based telescopes were there so if we lived on alpha centauri and we took the best technology that we have here on earth the hubble space telescope our ground-based telescopes and we looked back at the sun what would we be able to know and the reality is is that we wouldn't even be able to know if there are planets orbiting the sun we don't know if there are planets orbiting alpha centauri now there was some people thought they found some planets orbiting alpha centauri uh, but it turned out that they were incorrect and people have found a planet orbiting proxima centauri because it's lined up in a way that we can detect it and so if the planets were perfectly aligned directly in between the sun and alpha centauri then the alpha centaurans would be able to detect our planets but we know that they're not and so we actually have no idea um, whether or not Alpha Centauri has planets. The next generation of super telescopes, they're going to be able to do things like be able to directly image planets orbiting other stars. And so we may get to a point where, yeah, the James Webb or the next version, Louvoir, can just look at Alpha Centauri, block the light coming from the star and be able to see the planets in orbit around the star and same thing the alpha centaurans with their alpha centauri version of louvoir could look at the sun and see our planets but it's kind of amazing to think that we don't have the technology to detect planets at the closest star system to us that's how big space is and that's how hard this science is maximilian I'm skeptical. I don't see the benefit of launching multiple rockets compared to one bigger rocket. At the end of the day, the same amount of fuel is being launched into space. Just one utilized multiple rockets and the other a bigger one. This was a f comment back on the refueling in space episode. And I got that a bunch of times. And here's, here's the, the, the situation, right? Which is that if you're going to send a human expedition to Mars, for example, then you're going to need a gigantic rocket. And as you build a bigger rocket, the price of your rocket doesn't go up linearly. It goes up exponentially. You build a rocket twice as big, your costs go up significantly because it's a more complicated machine, requires more precision requires more strength in materials, more expensive materials. Everything just scales up much more in price. And so this is why the Space Launch system is taking so much longer and it's going over budget is because it's a bigger rocket. In the end, when the final block two configuration happens, it's gonna be a bigger, more expensive rocket than anything that's ever been built. And so it makes sense instead to settle on sort of whatever is the perfect size to get the job done, the one, especially if it's a reusable rocket, and then you do multiple launches, refuel in space at a place where now you need very little delta V to go to your final destination. And in fact, the rocket that can go from, say, lunar orbit doesn't have to have launched from Earth. It can be a completely different vehicle, something that doesn't have to be optimized for the gravity of Earth to take off from Earth, travel through the atmosphere, fly out to space. You could have something that is just a ferry from lunar orbit to Mars orbit that is completely customized to that job. So I think there's a ton of reasons why refueling in space make a lot of sense. James Sewell. Quasars seem like really strong sources of radiation. Would they sterilize any life in their home galaxy? Great question, and to get you an answer, I brought in a special guest answerer, Anton Petrov from the YouTube channel What to Math. Uh, he's going to answer your question. Hello, wonderful person. Oh, looks like I have a message from Fraser Kane. James asks, Quasars seem like really strong sources of radiation. Would they sterilize any life in their home galaxy? That's an excellent question. Well, first of all, what's a quasar? 
In short, the brightest object in the universe formed in the center of a galaxy when the supermassive black hole gets to absorb a lot of materials really, really quickly and becomes ridiculously, ridiculously powerful. And today we believe that different types of quasars we're looking at are actually just parts of evolution of a typical galaxy. And there's also some suggestions that maybe, just maybe, our own galaxy used to be a quasar too at some point when it collided with another galaxy. Which of course also suggests that when the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxies collide, they might turn into a quasar once again. But what does this mean to life? Well, it turns out that during the phase right here of the galactic evolution, the amount of energy produced by the supermassive black hole is so extremely strong that it actually produces enough gamma ray radiation, very strong gamma ray radiation, to cover like half of the galaxy. In other words, if we were to place our planet Earth where it is right now, at around 25-ish thousand light years away from the center, it would most likely be always bombarded by this ridiculously strong gamma ray radiation from the center of the galaxy. And this would, of course, strip the planet of pretty much any life whatsoever. It's almost like having a, a very powerful supernova in the night skies pretty much constantly there until the galaxy stops evolving. And what's worse is that uh, quasars are also very unpredictable. They're very, I guess you can call them, temperamental. They do increase and decrease in energy quite a lot. So any life that may have lived anywhere in this galaxy would probably not like this sudden increase in gamma ray radiation, and whole planets would very likely get completely sterilized. There would be nothing. Or well, we think so at least. Which also implies that if once upon a time the Milky Way galaxy was a quasar, maybe there was no life. Maybe we are the first life. But that's of course a speculation. The fact is that quasars are very powerful and would definitely destroy life in the galaxy. And hopefully this answers your question, James. And thanks, Fraser. See you later. Thanks, Anton. That was awesome. Um, now, if you haven't already, definitely check out Anton's channel. He does a new video every day, and I don't understand how, but... They're wonderful. He covers all the topics that are happening in space and space exploration and astronomy and uh, is an absolute master of Universe Sandbox. So check out his channel. I'll put a link in the description. I'm sure you're aware of it, but if you're not, you absolutely have to subscribe to him. So, all right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Uh, thanks for joining me along this journey of 100 question shows. Here's to a thousand more. I'll see you next week.